Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Bible-eating protesters on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Yes, Bible-eating. Those protesters snatched the Bible out of the man's hands, one of them ripping pages out of the book and then eating them. This incident took place on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison ahead of a speech by conservative author Matt Walsh, which critics called harmful to the trans community. Leftist protesters were spotted outside a speaking event by a conservative commentator surrounding and shouting down a man reading Bible passages before they snatched the Bible, ripped it up, and one protester ate the pages. I do find this very ironic because you have you know, parents across America going to school board meetings, protesting books that are in elementary school geared towards five, six-year-olds saying that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy. And what do they call them? They call them book banners and book burners. But now you got these far left activists tearing up a Bible and eating the pages. So, so are they, is that good? Is that, is that what the far left is about? Like, you know, book burners are parents, but the people that protest eating Bible pages are somehow, you know, heroes to be, to be lauded. I just find it hilarious hilarious, ironic. I mean, it's not a funny story. It's actually quite despicable. Um, but I think it's hilarious how, you know, these, these individuals, you know, have no self-awareness whatsoever. Recently, there has been a tremendous increase in mockers and scoffers that are attacking Christianity and the Bible in general. On two occasions, the Bible warns that the closer the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greater the mockers and scoffers will become. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude 1, 17 and 18 But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. What is so significant in both Second Peter 3 and Jude is, the prophets and apostles warned about mockers and scoffers. Apparently, the mockers and scoffers are a sure indicator we are living in the last days. During Monday morning rush hour, a massive barrage of Russian missiles targeting the capital. Here in Kyiv, the first explosions heard just after 8 a.m. The city's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, reporting critical infrastructure was hit, knocking out power to some 350,000 apartments. And across the country, strikes reported from the southwest to Zaporizhia to the easternmost city of Kharkiv. The Ukrainian armed forces claiming to have shot down 44 out of 50 rockets. Over the weekend, Russia accused Ukraine of attacking warships in the Black Sea in occupied Crimea. 
the Russian warships that are used to launch cruise missiles into Ukraine. On Saturday, Russia suspended its support for the grain deal, halting all tankers from leaving Ukrainian ports on Sunday. The World Food Program chartered ship Akaria Angel, carrying 30,000 tons of wheat, was bound for the Horn of Africa. Delayed by a day, this morning, according to Ukrainian officials, 12 ships, including the Akaria Angel, have left Ukrainian ports, even without Russian cooperation. Now, it's not just the 350,000 apartments that lost power this morning. That also means emergency rolling blackouts for everyone else in the Kyiv region. Now, critical infrastructure was hit across the country. The other thing in the Kyiv region we've learned this morning, 80% of households are now without water. This as we head into a very cold winter. Those forced to live under Russian occupation, however, say liberation can't come soon enough. After six months in occupied Kherson, Pastor Alexander escaped the city with his wife and 10 children. When the Russians took over, we weren't sure what to do, but we decided to continue with our church services. Russian forces, on the lookout for so-called Nazis, searched his house several times. On September 6, they arrested him in front of his wife and children. I was kept in solitary confinement for six days when they put me in a cell where there were seven people but only three beds. During interrogation, the Russians tried to prove he was a Nazi, ironically because of an English Bible in his office. Pastor Alexander was more worried about photos on his phone. Many Americans donated to help with the construction of our church. He accused me of being an American agent. He was just looking for a reason to keep me. On my phone, there was a lot of evidence of my cooperation volunteering with the army. So that became my prayer that they would not even see my phone and Lord closed their eyes to it. Between interrogations, he shared his faith with his cellmates. My wife had managed to slip me a small Bible. So with that, I started witnessing to the other men and myself were there together for another 10 days. But the seventh day, they had all made Jesus Christ the Lord. That was when I finally realized why I was there. Romans 10, 14 and 15 How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Alexander had no idea if he would ever see his family again. While I was being interrogated, the commandant said, if it was up to me, I would shoot all of you right now and throw you in the landfill. They hate Ukrainians so much. They cannot even stand to hear the word Ukraine. Then, after 15 days of captivity, a miracle happened. An Orthodox priest, whom I had never met before, came to the commandant and asked him to release me. And he agreed on one condition, that he could keep my car. So at the church there was still a minivan, and we put all my family into it, along with the injured neighbor, and we had it toward the front lines. Their ordeal wasn't over. It took four days and lots of prayer to get through all the checkpoints to reach friendly lines. I saw such joy in my children's eyes when they first came upon Ukrainians. They saw soldier and said, look, they don't have masks. The Russians are all walking around in masks. And I said, that's because they have nothing to hide. Bandits always wear masks. Pastor Alexander and his family are now staying here in Kyiv and working with the local church while they pray for God's direction about when they should go home. But as Ukrainian forces move closer and closer to the city of Kherson, that day could come sooner rather than later. I know that he will continue taking care of us. So I'm trying to seek first the kingdom of God and wait for everything else. Rescue workers in the Philippines are searching for victims of deadly flooding there. At least 47 people were killed after torrential rains from a tropical storm set off flash floods in the southern Philippines Friday. More than 60 villagers from a coastal community are feared missing, possibly buried in a huge mudslide. This is what's left of the town of Datu Sinsuatudin in Maguindanao province in the southern Philippines. Houses are left in ruins, trees uprooted and cars were crushed. Typhoonology triggered intense rains that caused flash floods and landslides. 
lives were lost. Rescue teams resumed their search and retrieval operations as soon as the rain stopped. Several bodies were dug under thick mud. Many residents who survived were traumatized and said that they will never come back to live in the village. I didn't know what to do when I saw the raging floods and there were rocks coming down from the mountain. All I could think of is that my family must survive. Typhoonology has sustained winds of 95 kilometers per hour and gusts of up to 130 kilometers per hour. It is weaker than Super Typhoon Noru that entered the Philippines late September. But the amount of rainfall brought by Typhoon Nalji caused massive destruction. Alarm bells are ringing with the current unusually high temperatures in France and Spain, adding to worries about climate change-related shifts to the planet's weather. In southwest France, people flock to the beach as temperatures hit 29 degrees on Thursday. At the same time, Spain is experiencing its hottest October since records began. Concerns were also raised by climate experts this week when the UN Weather Agency announced greenhouse gases hit record high levels. Temperatures have reached 34 degrees Celsius in some parts of Spain. The freaky weather is expected to continue into the first two weeks of November. The UN has said there is no credible pathway in place to prevent global temperatures from surpassing 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, a goal set by the 2015 Paris Climate Conference, putting the world on track for potentially catastrophic outcomes. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real, and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. You had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Five rounds. They're in the ages of uh, 20 year olds to 60, uh, 60s. We're going to need another ambulance, possibly two more here. They shot up the sanctuary today. This has been one of the most devastating days of my life. We've got two in custody, involved in the homicide.
help us get these guns off the streets. A funeral for a victim of gun violence shattered by gunfire outside a church on Pittsburgh's north side. Six people wounded. Can you imagine you went to your great nephew's funeral and then shots ring out outside of the church? Investigators believe this mass shooting was targeted. Six people were shot. This is what fear looks like and sounds like. After bullets went flying outside Destiny of Faith Church in Pittsburgh's Brighton Heights, hitting six people during the funeral of 20 year old John Hernizes, who was killed last week in a gun battle on the north side. Italian police in Milan arrested a man who stabbed five people, killing one and wounding four others. One of those injured was Spanish footballer Pablo Mari. The man in question took a knife from a supermarket shelf before approaching and threatening people buying groceries. A man is in custody accused of stabbing two people to death yesterday in the parking lot of a Palmdale shopping center. The victim's loved ones are devastated. We talked to the woman's boyfriend. He's heartbroken. They have been dating for eight months. My heart didn't want it to be true. Yeah, same. But in my mind, the truth was that she was killed. She is gone now. Just in cold blood, just senseless. Tonight, Jesse Mercado fighting back tears after the murder of his girlfriend, McKenna Evans, and her father, Ken. Yesterday, the two were found stabbed outside their vehicles near Coles and Joanne Department Store in Palmdale. Our camera capturing the murder suspect taken into custody. When he was in handcuffs, he smirked. He, he just, he had a smirk on his face. How dare he? I hope. I hope he never gets out of prison. Elizabeth Evans lost her husband and daughter when the suspect went on this stabbing rampage. She says Ken Evans was in the parking lot working on his car before the attack. They don't know why the suspect stabbed them to death. There's a reason why crime is one of the most concerning issues for Americans. It's raging from city to city. Just these past few weeks, we've seen some of the most outrageous crimes caught on camera notably in cities that are deep blue with new bail policies and uh, progressive prosecutors who are letting criminals out of jail. And well, the first one starts in Chicago. This is just all from this week. In Chicago, a car care business owner went inside his business, left the front door unlocked. He was going to conduct a virtual meeting. A few moments later, he looks up and this man comes in with a gun. He does, though, Pete, something I think people are increasingly going to be apt to do. He fights back. I mean, watch this. He's got a gun waving at his face. His door was unlocked. He was holding gun a jam. He's think, jamming right? it, right? Yep. He's trying to he's trying to rack around. He can't. He realizes that's his opportunity. By the way, this individual pointing a gun at somebody else still at large. Let's go to New York City, where we've seen way too much of this over months. And this week we saw another subway rider pushed onto the tracks. This time it's 32 year old individual who's been riding the p subway Pete since he was in middle school his entire life. And this guy just he's, he's eyeing him up looking for a target wearing a mask and he tees off randomly again. They don't know each other at all. Now this is not something you see every day. No. This is in Pasadena, California. A woman attacks a home with um, a grandmother babysitting an infant just on the other side. She attacks it with a pickaxe. She's going at the windows. So this just went on, right? Surveillance video, Southern California, showing this scene, a woman armed with a pickaxe, trying to uh, get inside of a home, narrowly missing a newborn inside. The glass shards from these giant windows were literally double her size, right in her bassinet where my daughter was laying. If she was five seconds late, my daughter would no longer be with us. Let's go down to New Orleans where carjackings are on the rise. And his, this video uh, is of a woman who's walking out of a building, locked the gate, getting into her Honda CRV, and then a, a man who's been hiding in the bushes jumps out, grabs the car, punches her, as you just saw, jumps in, steals the car, carjacking which are way up in New Orleans. All of these just from this week from all across the nation. You can see why Americans are ready to do away with the policies that lead to these rises, this rise in crime, and are ready to make their voice heard in the coming weeks. Totally random, which means it could be anybody's, which is why fear is so important. And often, no arrests, 
and no consequences, which means the perpetrators feel like they can pull it off and do it again. So we've been talking about defunding the police. Suck it up. Defunding the police has to happen. We need to defund the police. Not only do we need to disinvest for in police, but we need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. So yes, defund your butts. Defund you. Mayor Eric Garcetti saying, take some of the money from policing, about $150 million. I applaud Eric Garcetti for doing what he's done. A lot of us were asked if we could imagine a future without police back in 2017 when we were running for office. And I answered yes to that question. We are going to reduce funding in the police department. What does the Bible say about lawlessness? To be lawless is to be without any rules or order. Laws are necessary in a sinful world as we read in 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. 1 John 3, 4 defines sin as lawlessness. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. When a society ignores the law, lawlessness is the result, and chaos ensues. The time of the judges after Joshua's death was marked by upheaval, oppression, and general disorder, as we read in Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Psalm 1, 1 through 6 tells us the way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. One of the reasons parents put up with this is anyone who says anything is instantly punished. Travis Allen learned that the hard way. He was a girls' soccer coach at Randolph Union Middle School in Vermont. He was just suspended from his job without pay because he complained about a male student looming around the girls' locker room. Then the school, because this is North Korea at this point, punished Travis Allen's daughter, Blake Allen, for speaking about it too. Blake Allen was on the volleyball team. Blake Allen and Travis Allen join us tonight. We're going to talk to our lawyer in just a moment. Um, thank you both so much for coming on. Travis, first to you, did I misstate what happened? You complained about a man in the women's locker room and you were punished? Correct. I made a media post, or sorry, a social media post that referred to the male student as a male and I was punished because I misgendered him. You lost your job or you're suspended without pay from your job? Correct, as the soccer coach. So you were the creep in this. I, I have to ask, did other employees at the school take you aside and say we're on your side? Did anyone protest your suspension? Uh, none of the other employees did. Uh, other community members have supported me, though, privately. It's, it's beyond belief. But, uh, thank you for complaining, by the way, at, at very least. <laughs> Blake Allen, what did you do wrong in the eyes of the school, and how were you punished? I was in the locker room, and the trans student walked in, and, and there was... Um, the rest of the team was in there and we were, I was really uncomfortable and I left and I told the school and they just shut me down and said there was nothing they could do and I was later suspended because I voiced my opinion that a male shouldn't be in the women's locker room and then when we filed a lawsuit they dropped the suspension. How, how, how old are you? How old were you when this happened? I'm 14. I'm a freshman. You're 14 years old and when you complained about a dude in the girls locker room you got suspended. Yes. Who says, can you tell us the name of the person who made that decision? Uh, Lane Millington. Yeah. And how, would, how did this adult communicate your suspension to you? What, what, what did you do wrong in the, in the view of this adult? Um, I think they were mad that I was telling people how I thought it was wrong and that a male shouldn't be allowed to 
be with us in the locker room? <laughs> You're 14 years old. Um, what, tell us what your classmates thought. Were they on your side? Yeah, a lot of my classmates were supportive. I think most people in the school are. They're just too scared to speak up because they see all the backlash I'm getting for it. Well, you're very brave. Because not dad only was brave. I suspended, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm supposed to do. I was going to do a restorative justice circle, and write a letter of apology. To whom? To the dude? The trans student. To the to the boy who was in the girls' locker room. Yes. You have to write and a letter of I apology. I said I would rather have a five-day suspension than have to apologize because I'm not sorry. How for old was? My opinion. Well, good. God, God bless you. How old was the boy? <laughs> Fourteen. Fourteen. Huh. Um, have. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to continue with the school? Um. Yeah. For now. <laughs> it's all. It's all so unbelievable. It really is. Yes. And it's only when people like you, Travis Allen and Blake Allen, take the lumps, stand up, tell the truth for just basic, basic human rights, like the right to change without some guy staring at you. It's only when you do that that things get better. So I appreciate that you both did and that you're willing to talk on the show. Thank you. I want to go now to your lawyer, Tyson Langhofer, who serves at Senior, senior Counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom. Tyson, thanks for coming on. What is the case that your making at the on behalf of of these two sure well the school district they retaliated against both blake and travis for just simply stating their views and and first amendment retaliation is 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 a uh, you know prohibited by the constitution i mean that's very clear that the government cannot retaliate against individuals simply for sharing their views i mean the crazy thing about this tucker is that uh, the, you know, Blake, Blake understands this issue. She doesn't need to be re-educated. Males are males, females are females. Blake shouldn't be forced to, you know, change in front of a male or watch a male change, but that's what they're forcing her to do. And they're trying to force their ideology down everybody's throat and then punish anybody that, that has a different viewpoint. That's unconstitutional. Well, I thought they cared about girls too. 14 year old girls don't have a right to get dressed without a boy watching. I mean, is anyone standing up for girls? I mean, I'm hardly a feminist, but, but what? Where are all the feminist groups? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, and, and then the, that's the really sad thing is when a, when a father comes and says, hey, who's standing up for my daughter? He gets punished. He loses his job. He's suspended yeah. without pay for simply saying, hey, what about my daughter? You don't know. What the sad thing is, is all the other fathers who didn't do that, who are cowering like the cowards they are in their homes and letting this happen to their girls without fighting back. They should feel deep shame, and I hope they do. The Bible's teaching on good versus evil leads to a challenging conclusion that every person is obligated to make a fundamental choice between the two. That choice is entirely determined by our response to God, who is both the definition of good and our Creator. That means either following His will or rebelling and choosing to sin. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it eternally. This means we either choose to accept God and His salvation or align ourselves against Him. While we may be imperfect and fallible, we cannot be neutral in our approach to good versus evil. We are either seeking the goodness of God or the selfishness of evil. The prophet Isaiah put it succinctly, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. 
believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. through Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14:17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive,
because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!